Black lives matter. Indigenous lives are sacred. We need the police held responsible. Amidst a pandemic, 2020 has seen massive global protests against racism. Here in Nova Scotia, Mi'kmaq and black communities share a history of racism that stretches back centuries. It's history just repeating itself in different ways over yes. and over and over again. Right? And it's like... How do you change today if you don't know what happened yesterday? Natil Batiste is Mi'kmaq and black. Her partner, Robert Downey, is African Nova Scotian. His lineage dates back to the black loyalists who arrived in 1783, freed from slavery and promised land here. But the widely held narrative of Nova Scotia and what's now called Canada as a sanctuary glosses over a dark history as old as colonization. Slavery did happen here. Early Canada was a place where slaves lived and worked. And it really has shaped our country in ways that we probably don't even fully know yet. When you're looking at the history of racism, it goes almost from day one when the invasion of the Americas began by Europeans. Unfortunately, uh, Nova Scotia's racism is done with a smile. We don't really pay attention to our own backyards, but we'll pay attention to someone else's backyard. running into situations where I had to really defend myself, whether it was in a party and someone just randomly yelled out the N-word to me, and the next thing we know, that person's coming at me and we're having a full-blown fight. And it always came down to, I was either the girl from the reserve or I was the girl at the party that was black. Yeah. One, two. When I come, to remember the blood of my ancestors who run through me, I can never lose. This is Mi'kma'ki, territory of the Mi'kmaq, or Ilnu, the people. The French settled here in 1605. When member two met with Samuel de Champlain, he took his fingers like this and linked them together. Acadians, the Mi'kmaq peoples, I lift you all up for coming together in a good way. Mi'kmaq and Acadians celebrate a long history as allies, but part of that first meet and greet with the French was Matthew da Costa, a free black man who sailed with the French, acting as a translator to the Mi'kmaq. The whole history and story of Matthew da Costa is extremely important to the African Nova Scotian community. And I would like to say to all of Canada and to the whole history of, of African people in North America. Um, Lynn Jones, a longtime activist and community historian, says da Costa represents a beginning of a very long African Nova Scotian history and a deep connection to the Mi'kmaq. But while da Costa was a free man, French settlement in the early 1600s also marks the start of 230 years of slavery in what's now Nova Scotia. And it's been forgotten. It's, it's, it's like there's an erasure of their history and of their experiences and of their arrival and how they built um, institutions and what have you um, in this country and their interconnections. It's amazing how quickly history can be forgotten. Ken Donovan is a historian, retired from Parks Canada. He spent most of his career researching slavery, work he's still doing. I'll throw Quebec uh, early 1600s on, and in Nova Scotia very early on, people enslaved, and uh, it continues during the French regime and continues with the British. So there's a long history of enslavement in this country. And yeah, it was always papered over by saying, you yeah, know, no, Underground Railway, we rescued people. Well, that, that's not the way it was. I was able to identify 420 people 
from 1713 to 1820 in Cape Breton that were enslaved. In Canada at that time, two-thirds of slaves were indigenous, also called Pawnee, but not the Mi'kmaq, who the French considered allies and warriors. Louisbourg was founded in 1713 after the Treaty of Utrecht saw France lose their holding. Most slaves here at the fortress of Louisbourg were black. Like when you're talking about the history of slavery, I don't think most people really associate it with the fortress. Well, no, most people don't associate it with Canada, really. That's true. Sarah McGuinness, a historian with Parks Canada, gives me a tour of the fortress of Louisbourg. Which is just the head of that colony, so it's important defensively. Um, it's also an important site for the Mi'kmaq. It's sacred ground to me. All of it is sacred ground. This is a place of war, but it's also a place that our own people are buried. Our own people fought here. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, Trina. How are you? I'm awesome. Lindsay Marshall works at the Mi'kmaq Interpretive Center. How much do you know about the uh, relationship between the Mi'kmaq and the, and the black slaves that would have been here in the fortress and elsewhere in Nova Scotia? Well, I think there was a common um, kinship with them because uh, with, the, with the black Nova Scotians and the Mi'kmaq, they had a, you know, at, at, at certain points in our history, we had each other protect each other. That relationship exists today in, in my own family. I have, I have black Nova Scotia in my family myself. And, you know, I embrace that, I embrace all, you know, because uh, it, it, it makes us better. Since time immemorial, we the Ilnu, now known as the Mi'kmaq, have called this land our home. Oral history tells the stories of Mi'kmaq helping slaves escape. The traditions, the language, the history carries on our oral tradition and the stories keep coming. Lewisburg has one recorded marriage here between a freed slave and a Mi'kmaq hunter. Marie Marguerite Rose was a slave for 19 years. She was freed, married Jean-Baptiste Laurent, and the couple opened a tavern. In Lewisburg, it's our only really recorded instance, and she's really the first within what's now Canada to ever had that experience, so it's pretty phenomenal. I can actually show you that. Again. But Marie Marguerite Rose was an exception. The majority of the people who were here and who lived in slavery, died within slavery. So when you think about like the history here and the history of slavery, like what do people sort of need to realize? I think the most important thing is just that early Canada was a place where slaves lived and worked. Really, that impacted the way that this country was formed in a, in a meaningful way, for sure. At 12 years old, Nathiel Batiste moved from Boston to the Acadia First Nation at the western tip of Nova Scotia. So it's like growing up, even for me coming from the States, I'm sitting in school saying, wow, I never want to move back to the States because that's where all the slaves were and this is where the land of the free is. Nathiel says the history of Mi'kmaq and black communities in Nova Scotia is almost invisible unless you go looking for it. Even though there's such an in-rich history of the black loyalists down here, there's still that shock when it's like, oh wow, there's a black person walking down Main Street. Or there's and a native person. There's a native yes. person walking down here and it's like, no, there's so much history here, but you're just not taught it. Black Loyalists were former slaves who fought for the British in the American Revolutionary War in exchange for the promise of freedom and land, sailing to a new start in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick in 1783. Tour guide Jason Farmer explains. Each ship was boarded, inspected, and the details of 3,000 African descendants were put into a historic document known as the Book of Negroes. It contains their former slave master, where they were enslaved at, how long ago they made it to British lines, and whether or not they are holding a certificate of freedom. 
This is basically an inventory of the slaves that were being freed by the British. Their names etched all around the Heritage Center here in Birchtown. The land of the free narrative breaks down pretty fast. Slavery still existed. 1,200 men, women, and children came to Nova Scotia as slaves with an influx of white settlers. For the black loyalists, inequality persisted, promises were broken, and tensions with white loyalists soon erupted. Anyone trying to enter the town was beaten and turned away. This event would go down as the very first race riots recorded in North American history. I'm still blown away by that. I mean, like... But like, I understand it. Oh, yes, of yeah. course. And I'm sitting here like, oh, did it take place here? Did it take place right there? Like, I'm just trying to think of all the violence and all the things that happened. And I'm, I'm right here. I'm, as I'm walking and talking, I'm just trying to picture the race riot <laughs> as I'm walking. By this point in history, the Mi'kmaq had faced scalping proclamations, disease, loss of land. The Mi'kmaq would help the black loyalists with knowledge, including what to hunt and fish in this area and other areas throughout Nova Scotia. The Mi'kmaq helped the black loyalists survive their first winters in what's called a pit house. There's always that meanwhile. So meanwhile, while you're getting promise to land, the Mi'kmaq is getting their land taken away. And, and, but there's still a partnership there. So even though land was being taken away, there still shows that the black loyalists and the Mi'kmaq people, they still had such good hearts. They that knew they, they were had able, to coexist. They had to coexist had to with coexist. each other. Coming up after the break. There's nowhere that I've gone within a black community in Nova Scotia and have not found black and native people and taking the history lesson back home to North Preston. When you run outside of the community, you start to run into things, racism, stereotypes. Two decks on this slave ship are being used to hold people, stacked upon stacked upon stacked. And I was just kind of seeing like what life was like in their shoes mm -hmm. and how damaging that was to the generations to come. Natile Batiste and her partner Robert Downey described the Black Loyalist site in Birchtown as eye-opening. I like wanted to cry so many times in there. I was, oh, I was like, like, oof. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, was, All this information. There's a lot of triggers, right? You, yeah. connect, you connect with all these things that's happening. Yeah. And then it hit home sometimes, too, because yeah. you're here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, once you're here, it hits home. Because I'm home. Nova Scotia is my home, right? And then me coming from North Preston, it was like, um, I was, it was a wow factor walking into the door. Like, you know, I didn't know the connection was so strong, so lined and deep. This gentleman here is actually my sixth great-grandfather, John Farmer. African Nova Scotians can trace their ancestry to those who escaped slavery, black loyalists, Jamaican Maroons, refugees from the War of 1812, and to those brought as slaves from the early 1600s on. What's inescapable is the impact of slavery. Our names completely wiped out. They didn't, not, none of them withstood that transatlantic slave trade. The name didn't make it through. The language didn't make it through. Our connections to each other didn't make it through. That's horrific. See these places? They're starting to get torn down, take you back. My grandfather actually lives down here as well. My very first time going to North Preston, um, I was being told all the negative stuff. But really, my first drive up there, I was just like, well, this this is a reserve. They're living the same type of um, struggle. This is where Robert grew up in North Preston. Home sweet home. Where his family still lives. You can find someone in each house that you know, or that knows someone, or oh, that's my aunt, or that's my uncle, that's my brother. So that sense of, I guess, familiar feeling is something that we safe. hold. Yeah, yeah, you feel safe. You feel safe. That's a good way to put it. 
As the largest black community in Nova Scotia, there's a stigma attached to North Preston as a dangerous place. It was a hard thing to get around. And then like just the simple stereotypes of the community. You know. It was all negative. It was what was portrayed on social media. But then when you run outside of the community, you start to run into things, racism, stereotypes. My last name, for an example, the name of Downey, is smeared all over Google in the most negative way. Just the Downey name in terms of people who have been involved in um, criminal activity. You know, so it's hard to even present uh, a resume to a job that says Robert Downey from North Preston because of the history behind the last name of Downey. When I first met my boyfriend's grandmother, she's like, oh, you're native. And right there, it was a history lesson. She's like, I want you to know that when our family first moved here, it was the natives that helped us. Um, and it was like I appreciated her in that moment because she connected me to the history of the land that was going on there. Preston was settled in the early 1800s. Around the same time, early Indian reserves were created. There were over 50 historic black communities in Nova Scotia, often in proximity to Mi'kmaq communities. We all were on, on the outskirts because of the racism the systemic and overt and covert racism that we face in those matters, we often tended um, to be more comfortable with each other. We don't have to go back 400 years to find that shared history of racism. Just look at the last century. The home for colored children, the Shubenacadie Residential School, forced relocation for the Mi'kmaq and the residents of Africville. Segregation in schools legally ended in 1954, though segregation can be a lived experience in isolated black communities and Mi'kmaq reserves even today. Poverty, over-incarceration, racism in policing. When you're looking at the overall picture of racism in Nova Scotia, the treatment of both people after slavery, of course, was abolished and the uh, uh, effort to exterminate the big mob was over. Uh, suffered the same kind of racism. Uh, justice was denied right across the board. Mi'kmaq historian Dan Paul wrote the book, We Were Not the Savages. A respected Mi'kmaq elder, he spent decades pushing for change. <laughs> for this statue of Edward Cornwallis to finally come down in 2018. Cornwallis, commemorated as the founder of Halifax, issued scalping proclamations on the Mi'kmaq. A friend of mine, Charles Saunders, a, a black man, a newspaper man, one went to, once went to a presentation put on by Mi'kmaq, and the Mi'kmaq simply made a statement that the, uh, the big man were lower in the white man's estimation than the black man, uh, the slave. He said, I always wondered how could anyone be lower than a slave? And, it, and he said, when I read your book, We Were Not the Savages, I found out. And the reason for it was simply that the slave had value where the Mi'kmaq had none. The 1960s and 70s marked an era of change. Lynn Jones says Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotians worked more closely back then in the fight for social justice. We didn't dissect things the way we do today. We didn't have a sense. We thought we were all the same and fighting for the same things and the same resources. But a divisive political difference, the Mi'kmaq fall under the Indian Act, a set of laws that apply only to status Indians in Canada. There were so many differences that we forgot along the way what we had in common. Our paintings of this piece is a Aboriginal and Black piece. Uh, as you see, Black Lives Matter, Aboriginal Lives Matter. Because we're looking at two very oppressed groups of people and they are being oppressed by the exact same person, that there would be strength in numbers. I think that that would be a, a, like a great chess move. 
But unfortunately, because of colonialism and colonization, um, the segregation and separation is what keeps us apart. So it keeps our numbers down, it keeps our strength down, and we don't have the same voice. Tanya Paris is an activist, an artist. She's black, Mi'kmaq, and her Cree grandmother lives with her. I am who I am, and I love every aspect of who I am. Tanya says there hasn't been a lot of room in the conversation for people who identify as both Mi'kmaq and black. Number, she says, is bigger than people think. 90% have Mi'kmaq blood, 90%. There's nowhere that I've gone within a black community in Nova Scotia and have not found black and native people. So when I went to boxing, the very first workout, once I broke a sweat, I was like, this is kind of what I need to just like mentally survive everything that I was going through. Etiel Batiste experiences racism as a Mi'kmaq and black person in different ways. When a black person works, walks down the street, it's external. They have to wear everything on the outside of their skin. As a Mi'kmaq woman, it's her bloodline and where she lived growing up as the kid from the res. When you are living this lifetime as a person who is a Mi'kmaq woman, and you know there's a huge statistics against you that one day that might be you, or on the other side, you're looking at Black Lives Matter and you're seeing a police officer and you're like, oh, please don't pull me over. Black Lives Matter rallies erupted after the world watched a police officer kneel on George Floyd's neck for over eight minutes, I can breathe. killing him. Everyone saw what happened. Everyone saw that video of George and all those things that just get swiped under the rug. We were all witnessing it. I was watching it unfold and uh, didn't surprise me really because uh, this has been going on a long, long time, not only in the States. Uh, I know Canadians like to get a little snobby like, and it's not us. Like, hell it isn't. Uh, it happened here in Canada, and it's still happening in Canada. Coming up next week, what happens when Mi'kmaq assert treaty rights, confrontation, and racism? Because they're of our rights, our treaty rights. Yeah. 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 Yeah.